Welcome to the Bob Health HealthCast, episode number 342, a case study involving conceptualizing doctor-patient relationships. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moppet and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Moppin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Moppin's office is currently accepting new patients. Today we're going to talk about something that I see every day, and we're going to take all the patients who have been, had this issue and put them together into one case study. So a patient comes to me often from another series of doctors who have belittled them or told them that they didn't have anything wrong or didn't listen to them, what they, they somehow didn't feel like they were heard, mm-hmm. or they felt like the doctor had, had ignored their complaints. Now, both of those things are somewhat traumatizing to some people and very traumatizing to others. Mm -hmm. And and the symptoms that they were describing were all symptoms of low testosterone. They couldn't sleep. They had hot flashes. That's also estrogen. They had no sex drive. They had no ability to have an orgasm anymore. They basically couldn't think anymore. That's huge. They, They literally couldn't get out of bed to go to do their job or take care of their kids. These are huge issues, and they're issues that can come on quickly if you have a hysterectomy, and issues that can affect you slowly over time. But many patients come to me after they have not found the answer with another doctor. And we want to discuss both the doctor's side of this, from the doctor's Mm -hmm. perspective, the initial doctor's perspective, and mine, as well as the patient's, because I hear... I hear what the patients say, but well, yeah. I'm not talking to the doctors. If, if I'm a new patient and I come to see you, and I'm uh, an elderly gentleman, <laughs> and I'm having anxiety and anger issues because I can't make my body do the things that it has always done mm-hmm. naturally, I can't do it. I don't have the energy. I don't have the strength. You I don't feel have the old. balance. I feel old, and I'm worried about dying. And I've gone to this doctor, and I've gotten some treatment, and. I don't feel any better. And when I try to talk to the doctor about it, I I feel as if he just dismisses me, blows me off. He gives me a piece of paper to read. He tells me, well, you're just getting old. You're going to have to live with it. I mean, that's what happens when you get old. Mm -hmm. You're in great shape. You know, you need to suck it up. Uh, And and as a male, men are more used to being told that, especially about things with regard to their body. (laughs) But in today's world, what is now possible is I can go out on the Internet and I can start looking for these symptoms treatments, doctors, who shot John, and yeah. yeah. And and I come to you then, and I have all this quasi-knowledge or semi-knowledge and a whole boatload of frustration and anxiety. Mm-hmm. And I walk in, and my nonverbals are not necessarily respectful. They're, they're angry. High you're volume. angry. They're I mean, intense. I understand it. And you're, and, and, you're upset. But, but you're just sitting there. <laughs> Some new person's coming in, and you're ready to practice medicine. You're ready to do what you know. Mm-hmm. And you have to, first of all, experience my stuff and find your way through it to guide me to a place where I'm going to be healthy. It's all those things that they thought about Yeah. when they were talking to their doctor, and they then thought about it at home, and it all boiled up, and then all of a sudden... They see me as that same doctor that they went to in the beginning. Let me t- let me talk one second about okay. the initial doctor. Say, let's go to a female patient. A female patient who has a hysterectomy and has her ovaries removed has a drastic change in hormones. And nowadays, in the brilliance of the American College of OBGYN, they've said women don't need estrogen. So doctors say, well, I'm following the guidelines. I'm not giving you any estrogen. So they have severe, immediate hot flashes. They're miserable. And all of those symptoms that I described in the beginning hit all of a sudden. And I had this Mm -hmm. and I understand this. Okay. And I understand from from the patient's perspective and the doctor's perspective. But the doctor's thinking, well, I did a successful surgery. I'm not talking about my doctor because she was awesome. But I mean, I'm talking about... 
the usual OBGYN Dr. is going to, Dr. X yeah. is going to say, I did a perfect surgery. Yeah. You have, you have an excellent outcome. You're on your feet. You're moving around. What's the problem? So in his or her mind, his job was done very well and we're complaining about it. Okay. Right. Right. It's not that job that we're complaining about when we're patients and we're upset when our ovaries are gone. It's that we don't have an answer to what happens in the aftermath. Well, yeah, it's a joke about the operation was a success, but the patient died. <laughs> yeah, well. You know, the operation fit, hit all of the statistical parameters, and the doctor and the nursing staff can be proud because they did it exactly right, roll them out, roll the next one in. But the person that rolled out comes to... And they suddenly have changes in their life that they can't understand, that weren't warned about, don't know how to cope with. And even if they were warned about, they had no idea how bad it yeah, would be yeah. or they dismissed it. So usually those things are on the the risk that you well, sign yeah, your you life away. you sign this thing for anesthesia, so, you know, you could die. Okay. Well, but yeah, but you don't expect to. So in this case, I have sympathy for the doctor. They feel like they've done a great job. What's the problem? They get angry and threatened. And so they then dismiss these other symptoms. I get that. That's a, that's a psychological defense mechanism. So I'm not really complaining. I'm just saying. I, I have a question about that. I have a, yes. The, the conversation that we've been having is an ongoing conversation about the focus of medical treatment. Mm -hmm. If I'm that surgeon and his staff, who've hit all the marks. Mm -hmm. I've done an excellent job on all the scoring rubrics mm -hmm. that we use. So I'm happy. But the patient has symptoms and and uh, isn't happy. That's not my problem. You approach medicine differently. I do. I do. But part of that is is that I've always approached medicine differently. It's okay. really about the patient and how happy they are it's and how healthy and they outcome, feel. Symptom reduction. Make and, them feel good. And I've, and I've always done that because I always put myself in the place of the patient. Right. If I don't feel well when this is over, then I need some help. So this doctor could say, I'm going to send you to a hormone specialist, but they don't because the guidelines from the American College, which is God to them, says, oh, women don't need estrogen, which... It's like guys telling me I don't need estrogen. They don't know what that means. Are, so that's I don't. I, that's not helpful. But the doctors following guidelines. Are doctors taught in school at all to consider the importance of the psychological issues, the emotional issues that patients are having, no matter what the presenting problem is, and encourage, find, hire, get a counselor, a psychologist uh, to to have a collegial relationship with to help manage these patients that have these issues that are not precisely, strictly medical? In general, well, how, 40 years ago? I, well, I mean, 40 years ago, I know, but 40 years ago, they laughed about that. Right, I know. I mean, the teachers, <laughs> our teachers, our doctor teachers laughed about stuff like that. Now, so you're thinking that's how everybody was trained, who's 60-something. Oh, I've had a lot of conversations as a counselor with doctors who are extremely dismissive. I'm the physician. You're right. a peon. I don't need any input from you. If I need you, I'll call you. I really hated that about medicine, even when I was training. I thought that was the wrong way to make someone well. Just my personality thought that was the wrong way to make someone well. And it is. But nowadays, now my daughter's a DO, so she has a much more, I mean, a larger, a larger training period a lot and she had one-on-one -on -one training with each private doctor and she was trained by mds believe it or not right. and dios and she was trained to think about all the holistic, holistic part right. of the patient which means their spirit and their and their their symptoms and their lifestyle and to put that all together but nobody can put it together in seven minutes which is basically what the insurance company the average will pay allowed, you for right. to see a patient Right. So yeah, they all have computer programs that tell you, oh, a headache is worth seven minutes. Right. Uh, I mean, a insane. Knee ache is worth thirteen minutes. And I, I always used to say my appointments are twenty minutes because I can't say hello in a minute. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. just I just can't do it. And so basically, that's why I, one of the reasons I changed to doing the medicine as I do with an hour to discuss. A okay, problem. so this case study is a two-edge coin. One edge is you, the doctor sitting in a room with a patient that's emotionally ra radiating anxiety, confusion, hostility, mm -hmm. distress, anger. And, and I'm coming into this cold. You're walking into this cold. The, the other side is the patient 
who really is looking for an answer that's going to solve their problem, take mm -hmm. their symptoms away. And they're starting to believe that doctors are giving them the runaround or, or lying are charlatans to in some mm -hmm. respect. They're just in it for the money. They don't want to put in the time. I and mean, they got all these attitudes about doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you get past all of that to get to... Tell me about your symptoms. Let's see what you're doing that helps or doesn't help. Well, thankfully, I don't deal with that every day with right. every patient. Well, no. I mean, I, even if many patients are just thankful to get to somebody who will help them. Yeah. So they aren't they aren't angry or upset. But for the for the patients that are, well, it helps that you have a good reputation. Yeah, when it does. In, and they expect to be better yeah, in, in some way when they come. So. Basically, when they do come in and they're very, they're so upset, mm -hmm. I first listen to them and let them kind of calm down, listen to their story, because it's important I hear it, it's important they say it, and then, then most of the time I have to stop them because it, it is rolling into just anger, and that's not going to be helpful. Yeah, they're building so, head of steam. So then I say, I, I got the situation, I understand that. So now I have to take the problem apart. Now, what's the worst, worst symptom that you have? Right. And how long has that been happening ever since this surgery? Or was it before? When did that start? And then I start bringing them into specific problems that they have. So that takes the, takes the attention off the doctor that they mm -hmm. had and off of me, but puts it back on them, which is what we're here for. And you break it down into manageable or digestible chunks. Yes. Because one of the challenges that, that often exist is the expectation of immediate improvement. And when yes. you're dealing with human anatomy and physiology, you're not going to get immediate improvement. Right. You know, uh, so patients will say, I mean, I mean the, the classic joke about diets is I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to lose weight. I won't eat anything today for lunch except a salad. I'll go home. I'll skip dinner. I'll get up in the morning. I'll get on the scale. I'll weigh the same thing I weighed yesterday. So I give up. And so I give up and say, well, diets don't work for me. Right. And medicine is not that kind of, I mean, it's not a, you, you get a shot and you're immediately better. Yeah, you walk out of the office and already, yeah, you're already fine. Your face is not blotchy and your weight's falling <laughs> off. And, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. And hormones really don't work like that. Right. So we have, we have to give somebody a, um, time frame from which to measure their symptoms. So usually nothing happens after pellets for two full weeks. So part of and a month yeah. is, is usually as good as they're going to feel from that dose. But they may have some other issues that will straighten out over the first four months. But part of the challenge for you then in getting this patient's attention, first of all, as you said, is I have to spend some time hearing them and making them feel like they're being heard. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, I need to talk to them about management of improvement. The fact that it's going to take a little time. So you need their trust and mm -hmm. you need their compliance to focus on what you're doing right. and do what you ask them to do. Mm -hmm. Because by the time they've gotten, these particular patients, by the time they've gotten to that place, they are pretty non-compliant. They're, they're grabbing for straws everywhere they turn, trying something for a week or three days, or and their friends call or the internet rings and they've got new yeah. ideas. Oh, it, honeybees will solve the problem. Oh, <laughs> wait, the nectar of... Guitar will solve them. But, but that's, but, you know, I totally understand that. I get it. Yeah. If you're so miserable for so long, you'll try anything. But after they've come to me and we have a treatment plan, yeah. I expect them to follow it and not to, <laughs> not to call daily and say, well, this didn't work and that didn't work. And that, I mean, oh, it, yeah. you have to be patient it's taken a year or more probably to get to the place where you are, maybe 10 years. So part of your and you have to be patient is to talk them into that. Yeah. Not in an aggressive or accusative <laughs> way. No. You know, I can't help you because you're acting out. No. But in a not... way that says, okay, we're going to make this better. I have experience with this. I know what's going on. I'm comfortable with that. I've seen 500 people with this already, but it's going to work this way. If you do what I tell you mm -hmm. and you do it for three months, then we can assess it and make an adjustment. And the biggest problem but is getting them in two weeks. to hear me <laughs> yes. while they're talking over me. Right. No, no, you have to, you have to stop. <laughs> I have to, I have to stop them because yeah. if you're talking over somebody else, you're not hearing a thing they say, and then you just keep repeating. So what I try to get them to do is to calm down a little bit and then say, you have, 
what I'm giving you is a treatment plan that should work. I'm not guaranteeing it, it should work, we'll have to tweak it at four months, but we, it is a treatment plan that has worked for thousands of other people, it should work for you. So that's what I want you to do. And then we get a call and I've got this side effect. Well, did you take your spironolactone? No. Well, I told you to take your spironolactone. Well, I didn't want to, I don't like pills. Well, I'm sorry. I don't like pills either, but I have to take them. There are certain things you have to take pills for. And so if you, you don't want facial hair, then you're going to have to take spironolactone. And that's why you were having this problem is you right. didn't do what I asked you to do that I told you I know this works. So then I go over everything and say, are you doing this? And No. Right. No. And so, so what that does if you're the patient is you're setting yourself up for failure and a really long time to get better. Right. And you're setting me up for failure. Too, because what I told you was going to work isn't going to work, but it's not because I didn't give you the right plan. It's because you didn't execute it right. The other issue I get is, well, I'm now taking these five different supplements I didn't tell you I was going to take. Right. And they're all new. And my, my brother has this one. So I took this and then I took his drug. Yeah. Because I I'm, I'm, still, I'm still not just, sleeping, yeah. Yeah. so I took that drug. So now I have this side effect. Well, that's not from what I'm doing. My next-door neighbor gave me an Ambien. And, I, and many times, I don't even know until at the very end right. of a conversation that they actually had another treatment from either another doctor or from a friend's drug. I mean, if you have another treatment and your treatment plan for your doctor is not working— you should tell them that you have this other treatment. It took me 45 minutes, this is a long time ago, for this dear sweet woman who had had pellets forever and had felt great, she comes in and she, she, she accused me of not giving her real pellets. You didn't give me real pellets. I don't feel good this time. I don't know what you did. You know, so it was that kind of a conversation. It was accusatory to right. begin with. Right. So it took me 45 minutes to find out that this lovely woman who had turned into an angry bear had had IV steroids for a treat for something. Right. And these were very strong steroids. And then she was given oral steroids afterwards. And we have in our literature that if you take any kind of adrenal steroids, it can inactivate what we do. That was the answer. <laughs> well, but, and but the problem it took in her forever. Mind, I mean, the, the problem in reality out. is she comes to you and she gets that story and that information about the treatment that you're doing. But then she goes to a different doctor for a different issue, and mm -hmm. his treatment is to give her the IV steroids well, and for she, what he's working on. She with. needed them. Right. And, and so, but, how is she to know? And, and does the other doctor know, or does the other doctor even care? I mean, the, the other if, doctor doesn't if care. You're and it triage, was you know, I'm trying to do treat for my issue. Mm -hmm. You're trying to treat for your issue, and we're not talking to each other, right? And, and so then the patient is sitting there going, none of this stuff works. Nobody knows what they're doing. Right. I know that's that's what they think, but my my view on steroids is if you need them, you've got to take them. Right. But if there's another if there's another option, then Right. Ask for the other option, because and we have that in our literature, but not many people read it. They should, uh, but because we can't go over ten hours worth of material, that's why we write it down. Yeah. So this is one of those things where we were. Um, I was trying to sort through what had happened to her, and she'd forgotten she'd seen this doctor, and she'd forgotten she'd gotten this and that medicine. Makes perfect sense to me as well. I know, I understand that. Yeah. But but we asked, did you get any other meds? And right. you know, have you seen another doctor? Have you been in the hospital? I'm not saying steroids are bad because you have to have them. If you have to have them, they're they're life saving often. But then you have to know, yeah, the pellets aren't going to work so well. Well, and for as a, a month, as a, for as a, a month person, or two, I can tell you. Uh, a lot of people don't understand the physiology, the hormone balance, the chemistry. I try my best. And so, like, <laughs> I go to the dentist, and the dentist wants to know, are you taking any new medicines? Are you on any supplements? Mm -hmm. Are you taking vitamin B? Are you taking vitamin D? Mm -hmm. Are you on an antidepressant? And I'm thinking, what the hell do you need to know that for? I, I got a toothache. Right. But they, they need to know I, that. I understand that. Now. <laughs> I, you know, I had to be trained to understand because mm -hmm. it, it and, interacts. And as an ordinary person in the community, I don't. I'm looking like, why are you being so nosy? Why do you need right. that? Which makes which makes the next step that you don't write it down. Right. I don't tell them. I, I you say, don't no, tell I'm them, and then it. it's not about an allergy; it's about an interaction of the drug. I, 
I know that now yeah. because you badgered yeah. me with it, beat me into submission. Yes, I have. But but it is a complexity in the relationship between the patient and the doctor. So put a bubble around this. What, what we're really talking about is the dynamic interaction, the communication skills of both the doctor and the patient to set the holding environment. If, if I come in and I'm upset, I am ill, I have symptoms, I want to be better, but I have this history of going you know, from first base to second base to third base and not getting any better, then I'm going to be skeptical, I'm going to be resistant, I may be non-compliant, and you're sitting there taking me in as a new patient, looking at all my data, trying to help me manage my symptoms and get better. Mm -hmm. So we have to find a way to make that work. And that's a significant part of successful medical treatment. And, you, and you're not going to have that as readily when you're on the seven minutes of patient treadmill. You right. need time. We to need spend. to get HMOs and PPOs out of our, out of our office, basically. And computer responses for <laughs> symptoms and treatments yeah. that are being read by high school graduates. Right. Who that, are looking at code he's, words. he's referring yeah. to when you call into an insurance company, somebody who doesn't know anything about medicine is telling the doctor what what and and the nurses right. whether they can give this drug to a patient or you not. You need to be given this drug because that one's not in our formulary. So I mean, and or we're not going to pay for that, even if it's cheap. They just. Yeah. They're not going to pay for it. So Yeah, which is a whole different conversation for a different day. But that, that's part of the issue. So what, what Kathy and I wanted to talk about today was the importance of that approach that's based on the safe holding environment, that's based on good communication skills, good observational skills. And part of practicing good medicine is the ability to hear the patient and calm mm -hmm. the patient down and focus them on what you believe as a physician will make them better. Right. And then... We also need to have the shared understanding that physicians are, are just people. Not all physicians are great at communicating. No, once Not, you put and, on that white coat, you get elevated to a status of divinity. What? Yeah, well, not not in this generation. So I grew up that way. Yeah, but you're, that's a different generation. <laughs> so, so the other thing is that the... Uh, doctor may not be having a good day. I, you know, if I had somebody in labor who was stuck and I was worried about her, it was really hard for me to yeah. come into the room and focus on a GYN problem. Right. I had, I mean, it, yeah. it took years to get that to happen and to take out the noise of worrying about somebody else who's going through something else. So, so many we, times that happens have, to doctors. I, I have a client at eight o'clock that's suicidal. She leaves, and my nine o'clock client comes in, and he's having test anxiety for final exams. That's that's the you know right. I mean, but you have to learn to compartmentalize. Shut that door. Open this door. Pay attention. Attend to this person. See them. Hear them. Manage their emotional state, mm -hmm. and then manage their medical state. Right. Right. So, so hopefully, you'll find a physician that can do that, or you can help them do that mm -hmm. by your own level of awareness, communication. Uh, Following their directions and, you know, and knowing that the treatment plan they gave you is a treatment plan and that, and it all goes together. You can't just do one, one thing and not the other. I ask any number of people I know pretty regularly, where did you get your medical degree? Because they're always trying these new things they found on the internet mm -hmm. or they're trying things or they're, they're issuing value judgments about treatments mm -hmm. that they don't know anything about. I know. And they're I playing know. with their own health or their kid's health or their wife's health, you know. But they're confident because they read it on a wiki, uh, Wikipedia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it all... WikiLeaks. It, Wikipedia, Wikileaks. yeah. It all, it all depends on... I mean, that data may be right, but it may not be right for that person. Yeah. So we're not really challenging Wikipedia. I like Wikipedia. But we're challenging the fact that without the proper training, you can't put it into the right situation. That's, that's what the training's about. Right. Taking information and practicing practicing with patients and seeing the outcome over and over again that's what makes medicine such a an art and a science yes yes so, and for my for my little sales pitch i really think doctors do better when they have a relationship with a counselor or a psychologist that they can refer their patients to and, and cross reference what's going on we and do get a, get a better holistic approach to treating that person we do i mean that's that i i always use that well, i know you do that's, that method that's how we because found one another. Yeah. And, and when someone just fyi when someone says you should probably see a counselor doesn't mean you're crazy it just means you've got some emotional upheaval that medicine is not going to fix doesn't mean most people are crazy probably doesn't mean you're crazy <laughs> 
So we, we thank you for listening, and hopefully this will straighten out some of your anxiety about seeing doctors and understanding what the interplay is and maybe being able to straighten out your visit and make it more productive. I always say bring a sheet of paper with your symptoms on it because doctors are usually pretty visual. They'll look down at that. That saves you five minutes so you can spend on something else. We've done a couple podcasts on preparing for a doctor visit. Yes, we have. What you need to know, what kind of things you need to prepare, what questions you need to expect to answer, what questions you need to ask. Mm -hmm. So go back and check those out. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.